gardening friends, welcome to the New Garden. I'm John Dromgul. On this week's program, we're going to find out about America's number one house plant. You probably got one in the past. You may have been ill and someone brought it to you to cheer you up a little bit. It's called the African Violet. It's a wonderful plant, an assortment of colors, easy to maintain, easy to grow on a windowsill, and that's probably why it's America's number one house plant. Today we're going to visit with Ken Frobesi and find out about the culture of these plants, and he'll show you some of his exotics and some of those simple ones that you can grow on the windowsill, how to propagate them and how to fertilize them, and in general, just take care of them. Let's go visit with Ken. John. How you doing? Just fine. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for inviting us out today to see your greenhouses. Well, thank you very tell much. Us, tell us a little bit about um, what we called America's number one house plant. Is that true? It sure is. It's been grown for hundreds of years around the country, and uh, nowadays the new hybrids they've got are very improved varieties, and, and most everybody can grow them in their windows, and, and they do quite well. Where do they come from? African violets? Is well, originally they came from Africa, they come, mm -hmm. came from cliffs in Africa, but unfortunately the, today's hybrids are a far cry from what they originally had mm -hmm. back in Africa. Does that kind of imply it's a hardy plant then? It looks kind of delicate. Well, it is a little more delicate, but like I say, most people when they try to grow them in their windows and to find out how mm -hmm. easy they are to grow, they don't have the problems. When they find out the basics of culture and how easy they are to grow in their windows, and if they don't have the windows, they can grow in artificial light and it works out quite well. What were you doing when we came in? I saw you putting Well, on the I was bottom. putting a leaf support on the bottom of the yeah. plants. The leaf support is a plastic item that holds the leaves up and keeps them off of the pot tops. Mm -hmm. They're adjustable and they come in different sizes and it's a, a California product, but we've been using them for years and they'll slip onto the bottom of the pot with a rubber band and when they placed in, in, in spot, they hold the leaves out and they keep the bottom row of leaves from resting on the pot top where they cut through. Mm -hmm. And when they're put on the plants, that's how your, well, how your plants will eventually grow to a large size. That's a beauty right there. It's one of our show prospects. What's the name of this one? That's called Shimmer Frost and it's, from, it's a New York origination. We have plants that come from all over the country. This is another New York origination. This is a plant from uh, uh, Nashville, Tennessee from the Optimira growers called Optimira Yellowstone. And uh, this is a San Antonio hybrid here. Mm -hmm. It's uh, one from my friend Hortense Pittman in San Antonio. This is one from Granger Gardens out of Ohio called Kathy G. We've grown it for years. Mm -hmm. And that's another hybrid from Optimera. That's Optimera a Harlequin. one. It's a bicolor and it's a very good bloomer. But there's thousands and thousands of varieties. We get probably several hundred new ones each year. We keep about 800 new varieties on hand. But we weed through and try to get the best ones and then come back with something that's an improvement, uh, something that grows easier, something has better foliage, uh, something that's just culturally easier to grow, something we can get for our customers that will have easier luck with growing them in their windows and have good luck. I've heard them called the poor man's orchid. We call them that because uh, they're, they're a lot less expensive than an orchid is to grow, but they do bloom a whole lot more than orchids, and I've grown orchids before too, and, and we enjoy them both. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you seem to be able to grow them at multi-levels. What are you doing in this greenhouse here? I see okay. at least three tiers in here. All of our violets in the greenhouse are grown on wicks. And these particular cords in there are a particular type of nylon wick that's braided, has a cotton core, and they take up our solution in the trays. We carry fertilizer in the trays at all times. And this is a, a constant feed fertilizer. So we use a quarter of a teaspoon of fertilizer in the trays at all times, mixed with water. We bring the hose in. We don't do any special mixing. And then the, the, the plant actually sits on wire over the top of the tray. And when the plant's sitting down this way, the bottom of the pot stays dry. The plant's always filled with, uh, always taking up fertilizer. Constant fertilizing allows us constant bloom. And the plants, if they're doing good, they'll either have blooms or buds on them at all times. And from a little plant on, they, they get a good start with the fertilizer, and it just puts, it promotes a lot of growth. It looks like if you took a hose through here, you'd wet the foliage too much. We're very uh, careful. We have a hose nozzle, and we go directly into the tray. And we fill each tray individually, depending on what, how much water it needs. We use fluorescent lighting underneath the benches and on, on, underneath the trays, because these trays block out the light. We get some natural light from the sides in the greenhouse, but you don't have to grow African violets in a greenhouse or in a, in a special growing conditions. Even in your windows, you'll do mm -hmm. real good. And there's a lot of different ways to wick water in the home conditions that you don't have to have the fancy trays or, or even the, the ugly looking hardware cloth on the top of trays, but it'll work. 
Now this covers it up pretty well. It's right. really not obvious. I noticed that uh, your fluorescent lights consist of two different types of tubes. There are several different types of grow bulbs on the market. We use a Sylvania type light bulb that we've used for years, a Sylvania Grow Lux and a wide spectrum. Uh, one's a little more expensive than the other one. We try to use the most inexpensive bulb, the Sylvania uh, Grow Lux Wide Spectrum. And all of the tubes that are in the greenhouse, in, underneath in the fixtures, are that particular type of bulb. We replace the bulbs uh, approximately once every 12 to 15 months. We date each bulb when it goes in. After about 15 months, the bulbs will still burn, but they lose their intensity. And so the plants don't get the strong light they need to make them grow flat. When a violet's growing right, it's growing flat like a pancake, and the light gives them that source. Mm -hmm. Approximate distance from the, from the top of the plants to the bulbs is approximately 10 to 12 inches. Although you can have variants, you can go from 8 inches all the way up to 14 inches, depending on the number of hours per day. We burn our lights 12 hours a day in here. They're on timers, so if we're not here, the plants are still taken care of, and they get mm -hmm. the right amount of light. And they get their watering, too. They do. They're here. constantly. And people can do that at home when they go on vacations. They don't have to worry about a situation where they have to bring somebody in to water their plants. This with the, with the wick watering and in the reservoirs, they can fill the reservoirs with enough container uh, solution to last them for a week uh, on a vacation, and their plants look as good under fluorescent lights as they did when they left. And that's not true of other house plants. You no, it's sure not. You have to have someone take care of them. Yeah. And so many people tell you that when they get home from the vacation, their plants are either bone dry or they're flooded. It. Let's take a look at some of these uh, colorful varieties down here and uh, okay. maybe show me some of your favorites too. Well, we have a lot of personal favorites nowadays and uh, some of the new uh, varieties on the market are, are outstanding. This is a white uh, from White Bear Lake, Minnesota called Viking Maiden and it's a pure white. It's one of the only pure whites that we can say will stay pure white, although there's a lot of white bicolors on the market. That one does quite well. The plant right next to it is a red uh, from uh, uh, Nebraska called uh, Tomahawk and it's a very good dark red and there's several new varieties this is a new one that's just come out from New York called uh, Sun Sizzle and it's it's a large fuchsia with a white edge this is another plant from uh, uh, Granger Gardens out of Ohio and it's called Tonina and it was uh, it's a Japanese name that uh, Jim Iredom, the hybridizer up there, his wife is Japanese, so he names a lot of the plants uh, in, with Japanese names. This is an older plant that we still grow. It's called uh, Wrangler's Pink Patches, has variegated foliage. Variegated foliage is, uh, is something that uh, people love to see when their plants not even bloom. Yeah, right. It still has the variegation to it. Mm -hmm. When are they not in bloom? It looks like uh, these. I don't see a one with hardly a bloom on it. Uh, well, if they get the right amount of light, which is about 12 hours of light a day, African violets should bloom most of the year. Now, they'll go through resting periods. People say, well, my plants are not blooming right now. Why are they not blooming? Normally, it'll be seasonal changes. It seems like when the seasons change, the plants go through a little period where they may rest a little bit. But if a plant's been in bloom for months and months and months in flower, it's natural for them to go through a, through a periodic rest. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, they may need to be repotted. We try to repot our plants every 12 months. But we don't get to it all the way that uh, all the time, but it, it sure helps to keep the plants in fresh soil. And if they're in too small of a pot, they need to go into a larger one. Sometimes our first acquaintance with an African violet is maybe you're ill or something has happened and they give you one as a gift. When you receive one of those and you've never had one before, what do you do? Well, the first thing is to see what type of culture it's had. Uh, a lot of times the plants may be bought at a florist or another nursery, and if they don't have a wick in them, the first thing you shouldn't do is put a wick into them. If you go to some place and see a, a plants that have been wick watered, if you put a wick into the plant immediately without checking the soil, your plants can be waterlogged. The soil is the key to the wick process, and we, we make our own soil. It's a very lightweight soil that makes the plants do good because they can use the moisture in the soil in their root systems without waterlogging. If you put a wick in any pot, what happens is the plants can use so much water and the rest of it just seems to stay there in the soil and they don't like wet feet. Uh, another type of thing that people use when they water them sometimes is a saucer. And they've heard that they could set the plant in a saucer with water in it and it takes up the water. The fallacy there is some people put it in the saucer and leave it there. And you shouldn't leave it there more than five or ten minutes to let it take up that amount of water. Drain the, the water out of the pot and pour the excess off. Uh, if you give them too much water, they will rot. And the root rot is probably one of the biggest common mm -hmm. losses of violets. Most people say when they see the leaves limp, they immediately think the plant's dry, they pour more water in the plant. When a plant's limp or when a plant's uh, over wet, 
they have the same conditions, that loose, droopy leaf, and that's one of the things that we have a lot of problems with. So if we get one that doesn't have a wick, how do we water it properly? Okay, the best thing to do would probably be to top water it and into the sink, just take it to the sink and water it from the top. You can mix a little fertilizer in it. We use a constant fertilizing using a quarter of strength of the fertilizer at all times. You can mix it in a milk jug and put a quarter of a teaspoon of fertilizer in a milk jug, fill it up with water and keep it there for, for handy use. Water your plant thoroughly from the top, let it drain through the plant. When it quits dripping, put it back in your, your window or wherever you're gonna grow it. The main thing is don't let it sit in water. If it's gonna sit in a saucer for a short time, a few minutes is plenty good. How do you pick the right window? You try each window to see which one will make the plant do the best. Violets like the brightest light you can give them without direct sun. If you put them in direct sun, several things can happen. You can get sunburn on your foliage, you can get a, 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 a bleaching effect to the foliage. Might make the plants bloom real good, but they're not gonna look very nice. When you have them in a, a window that you don't get enough light, the leaves reach straight up. And you can always tell if an African violet's getting enough light or not by the way the leaves grow. Mm -hmm. If the leaves lay fairly flat like a pancake, we always say they're getting the right amount of light. The light can get to the crown, the center of the plant, where the buds form, and then you're going to get bloom formation. If you don't, if the plant's laying there and its leaves are reaching straight up and there's no buds, the centers close up when the leaves reach and you don't get the bud formation. Mm -hmm. And your plants tend to lean towards the light also. So when you're growing them in the windows, you want to make sure that you turn the plants. They should be turned periodically several times a week if you can do it. If you did it every day, it'd be great. And that's just a quarter of a turn to give it light from different directions so that the light will get it from all sides. If you put them in a window and you leave them and forget them, pretty soon the plant's going to be reaching toward the light and it'll actually grow out of the pot that way. What if I got one that was in beautiful bloom? And I put it in the window, and I thought it was the appropriate window, but it ceased to bloom anymore. Okay. And it just was vegetative. Uh, what do we do to get it back into that bloom cycle? Okay, if you bought one in full flower, you're going to have to remember that they're not going to stay with full flower forever. It's just like any blooming plant, they'll go through a cycle on their blooms. Their blooms will last for a good period of time. We say up to two weeks on a plant, and that's a, a long period for any plant. But if you have them in bloom, the, the blooms that are on there are going to eventually fade. So when a plant is, is blooming, you pinch off the individual flower that fades, not the whole stem initially. As the blooms start to fade 100%, you, you snap the whole stem out. And that, that gives the plant a chance to recuperate. When your plant is not blooming, it should be forming buds up underneath the leaves. And if they don't have the little bud formation, you may not have given the fertilizer, you need to give them the constant fertilizing, and the light again. If they don't get the light, they're not going to bloom. If they don't get the fertilizer, they're not going to bloom as well. So uh, that's an important thing. A lot of people ask the numbers on fertilizers. I've seen things right. like, um, well, 524, 2020, 20, a, a combination of things. You can what use your a, favorite? You can use a lot of fertilizer. We've tried uh, a lot of different types in the instant, in the beginning. But uh, we found out that the 123614, the African Violet Special, and we use uh, a brand that's, that's well known, but it's, it's just, it's an important thing to find a fertilizer that works. There are probably 50 different types of violet fertilizers out there on the market, but our 123614 uh, formula works best for us. But you try any one. If it works and it's blooming good, stick with it. These are leaf cuttings and what we do is we, we'll show you in a minute how we start our leaf cuttings but these are actually mother leaves in a, in a pot with the baby plants this particular variety is is from New York it's called hot pants and it's a red and these are the baby plants that are formed on these uh, leaf cuttings from each leaf you may get one you may get a half a dozen babies so you have to be real careful when you're putting leaves in not to overdo it with one variety we of course we try to get many varieties uh, at a time but each one of these pots is filled with leaf cuttings and the names on them reflect the varieties you, you saw some of the leaf cuttings in the back now let me show you how we actually propagate a leaf uh, our procedure is a little different than most we use a, a pot for the process and we use the same three and a half inch pot we use for everything else we started off with some violet soil on the bottom you don't have to put a lot just a little bit the roots tend to grow into that we fill it up with rooting mix and the rooting mix is a vermiculite and perlite mixture we use uh, two parts to three parts of vermiculite one part of perlite depending on the consistency of the product sometimes it varies sometimes it's finer the finer it is the more uh, we have to add to the mix uh, we level the pot off 
and then we put our leaf cutting in. The leaf cutting is a leaf that we've taken from a plant, preferably not a bottom leaf. If you use a young plant, a leaf off of a young plant, you can use almost any leaf on the plant. It will work fine. Uh, for instance, let's just take a leaf off of this plant right here and I'll show you how to, to prepare it. One thing you don't want to do is leave the leaf this long. The, the, the leaves should be cut to approximately one to one and a half inches at an angle from the top down. You can do this with an old knife, you can do it with a razor blade, whatever. You cut it at a slant. The slant part is where the babies come up from. So if you cut it straight off, the babies have to go out and up. With this particular uh, procedure, the, the slit part, the more slit that you can get on the top, the more babies you're going to have. When you insert that into the vermiculite, push it all the way down. Now, if you happen to have a leaf that's pretty large off of a bigger plant, we retard the growth by cutting a V out of the bottom of it, out of the top of it. And that, when, it's, when we cut the little piece off of the, the stem, we insert it the same way we do the other ones. So you can tell when we've, we've potted up a, a baby, when you're looking at the leaf cuttings, to see whether it's one that was from a bigger leaf or from a smaller leaf. These are both leaf cuttings that are in process of rooting right here. Now, they don't have the babies up yet. And again, here's the sample of what we, we showed you in the back. The, the babies coming up off of the mother leaves, and they come strictly out of the vermiculite and perlite, and they'll be from each leaf, there'll be several plantlets on each one. When we go to pot those up, we let the pot dry out slightly, leave it for a day or so, and then we separate the individual plants. Like I say, from one leaf, you may get a half a dozen babies. You don't want to plant that clump into one pot. If you do, you're going to end up with multiple crown plants to begin with, and that's a, that's a mistake. Now, how quick do the babies come up? That depends on a lot of things. It depends on the age of the leaf. If the leaf happens to be an older leaf, it's going to take it a lot longer for those babies to come up. I've seen situations where we've had six months or longer where the babies didn't show, and that was on an old leaf. If you have a young leaf, a young vigorous leaf, again, the fallacy of taking a bottom leaf, a lot of times they can be yellowed, they can be old, and they can be damaged. And if they are, they're not going to put up the babies as, long, as quickly. So if you use a younger leaf, and you, and you take a vigorous leaf from the plant, you're going to get babies quickly. We say two to three months is an average, and it takes a while longer for that baby to grow to a size. We like to leave them on the plant until they're at least two inches. This is plenty large to take off from the babies, uh, from the mother leaves. If you leave them on much longer, you're going to get a stalky appearance, and then you have to strip off bottom leaves, which we'll have to do on a lot of those in the back we've let go too long. But it, it, it's, they're not ruined. You can still use them. This looks like a good uh, device right here for a homeowner. This is just That's a margarine right. container. These are some different ways you can wick water your plants if you choose to go that way. Like I say, there's a lot of ways to water your plants. This particular thing is a margarine tub, and everybody's got one. And we cut a very irregular hole in the top, off-centered, to allow your pot to sit on there with its wick right down in the way, and that allows your plant to wick water. You can do that with your leaf cuttings, and you put your wick right down in the hole, you put your fertilizer water in the bottom, and you don't have to turn these as much in the window, but it doesn't hurt to turn them periodically if you're going to use your leaf cutting this way on the wick. When you have your, your plants wick watered, there's a lot of other ways. Uh, one of the uh, companies in Texas puts out a wick reservoir that's made for wicking. It has a fill hole and a slit in it. You put your plant with the wick straight down in the hole, and it works out great. A company out of Florida makes this particular one. It's like a Tupperware container that has a snap-on lid. has a wick hole also. It's very similar to the margarine tub. The newest thing on the market are some of these plastic reservoirs, and people say, oh, I've seen those before. They're, they're at novelty stores, but they don't have the hole cut in the top. And when you want to wick them, you've got to get the hole in the top. And the uh, company out of, uh, of uh, uh, Tennessee makes a small one like this. It's a very stocky one. You have to remember here that it doesn't hold much water reservoir. When you have a small water reservoir, the, the tendency is to fill it up too full, and if the bottom of the pot touches the water, you're going to flood it, and you don't want to do that. With the larger reservoirs that are taller, you have more water space, and you can go away for longer periods of time, and your plants will do take, be taken care of. The bottom tray is a way you can wick water if you have a bunch of plants. It's just a plastic tray with a, a plastic grid on the top. That's an egg crate material that's used as a fluorescent light diffuser, and you can cut it to size and put it on the top. It works great for multiple plants on the same, and it supplies humidity to your plants as well. Would you like me to show you how to pot up a baby sure. plant? Okay. As we said before, this is our leaf cuttings, and from one plant, 
from one mother leaf in here, there's going to be numerous plantlets. So what we're going to do is, is take, uh, we're going to take our knife and separate one plantlet out of the, off of the, off the mother leaf. We reach down into and pull it out very gently, taking as much root as we can. Mm -hmm. And that's an individual plantlet right there that has the potential to make a full-blooded African violet plant. You made just a light cut off yes. the edge of that leaf, uh huh? Well, the way we do it normally, if we're going to do a whole bunch of them, we'll take this pot full of leaf cuttings, take them off the water, let them dry out for a day or two in a tray, and they'll be the right consistency. When we take them out of there, we'll, we'll lift a whole clump at one time and put them on in a little aluminum pie plate and separate the little plantlets. Each one will have its same characteristic of having larger leaves and tinier leaves in the center. Mm -hmm. And we want to get only one plant per pot. The next thing we would do is to take and put a wick into a, a starter pot, into one of the small pots, a two and a quarter inch pot, and we would use a little potting soil in the bottom, maybe a spoonful or so in the bottom, just to give a little, little uh, for our plantlet to grow into. And now we can, we can put a little bit more in there. Actually, there's several different ways of doing it. One is to make, take your finger and make a hole in the soil and put your little violet plant in the center so that the roots are about there. You don't want to take the, the plantlet and put it too deep in the pot. That can be some of the worst. The same thing goes here is on the bigger plants, push the wick down after you've got it into the pot and your, and your soil in there, okay? You put your plant as near in the center of the plant pot as, as possible, and then you can add a little more soil around the outside part, and then we add a spoonful of the vermiculite and perlite mixture right around the top. What this allows the plant to do, it's been growing in that, and it allows the plant to get a good start, and then we just firm it in around it, not to pack it too much, but just to firm the vermiculite perlite. At this point, the plant's watered from the top. We put a name tag in there so we know what variety it was that we took off of the leaf cutting, and from there, the plant's ready to go on the wick. When we water it from the top, it will saturate the wick. It's ready to go right on a reservoir on our butter carton to where we can put that in the, in the window and make a, a new plant growing. From this plant right here, or from a leaf, from the time we put a leaf down to where we get a plant ready to bloom, it takes about six months, but they will grow much faster than that. And once you get them potted up, you'll see the growth in, in a matter of weeks. <laughs> I saw back there you had some uh, plants in this size container right here, and they were called starter plants, and they that's need right. repotting. When, when we take the babies from the leaf cuttings, that's what we start them in, the little starter pots, and they stay in there for us until they're big enough to go into a bigger pot. Let me show you how we up the plants when they're from taken off of the, the babies and, and when they get to a size that they need to go into a bigger pot. We prepare the wick in the pot by just slipping it in from the bottom. We take a pot, slip the wick in. Again, you can use numerous things for wicking, too. A piece of nylon stocking, a piece of pantyhose, a piece of uh, acrylic yarn will work. The next thing we do is fill potting soil into the pot, and we use a lightweight, porous potting soil. If you fill enough soil in the bottom to where you can take the pot that the plant's in. This particular plant we're going to up right today is in a two and a quarter inch pot. It's the same size pot. So the next thing we do is to set the pot on top of the soil that's been spooned in there, and we begin to fill soil into the pot from the top and, until we get enough soil in there to where the pot is filled to the top level. Uh, we try to get the pot in the very center of the pot and spoon it in, and when you're spooning the soil in, it's important not to pack the soil. If it needs to be tapped, tap the pot from the bottom a few times to let the soil settle. When you get the pot to the very top, the next thing to do is not to leave the wick sticking up too high. We've got sufficient wick out the bottom. We take the wick with the spoon a handle and push it down in the soil and cover it over. Then we take the inner pot that's there and wiggle it very carefully. And if we do it properly, we've got a perfect hole. That's the size of our pot. So then we take the plant itself, pull the old wick out, squeeze the pot a few times. We take the, the name tag out. And if, we're, if we do it carefully, we can get the plant out of its pot and it's root bound, ready to be repotted. Now, if, it, if it's done properly, you can slip the plant right down in the hole, form it in, just push it down a little bit. You might have to push a little soil over with your fingers, but basically your plant's already repotted. We do water the plant a little bit from the top 
The plant's already got its wick in it. It's, it you, this is a lot simpler than having to put spoon soil in up underneath the leaves. You'll get more soil in the crowns. This way, it's a lot less messy. I guess once you've made the decision to grow an African violet, the next thing to do is try to pick one. It seemed like there's uh, hundreds and hundreds of colors and sizes and varieties. When I was walking through today, I found this one called Flicker. Just a beautiful flower. I was really attracted to this. Little specks, just a kind of a man's flower for me. I certainly like this. Ken Frobasi today took us through all of those steps that make it real easy. Some of those simple things like turning it slightly every other day, just giving it that quarter turn, keeps that nice even growth on them. Those are tips that you'd never find anywhere else unless we visited one of the professionals. He's got a business called Hill Country African Violets and Nursery. He grows these wonderful plants and many other plants around here. If you ever get a chance to get into Central Texas, stop by and visit him. You'll find out that uh, you'll be falling in love with African violets too. Well, for the new garden, I'm John Dromgul. I'll see you next week. To order a VHS cassette of this week's program, send 2250 to The New Garden, PO Box 6121, San Antonio, Texas, 78209. Be sure to include the title of this week's show with your request.